All right, thank you so much for being with us. And Greg, it's really an honor to have you. Well, it's great to be here, man. This is my this is my first long form podcast, so I'm a, I'm a big fan, uh, and so I'm excited to to get going. It's really interesting that you know people like you get to talk to a lot of people about science, but not themselves, um, or in the long form. What do you think that is? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of used. Um, just as like the to get closer to the story right do they come and talk to the scientist and they kind of give you their perspective on it but it, it's yeah it's, it's about um it's about like a, 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 you give maybe a five minute interview and it gets clipped down to a few seconds and it goes on the air or something like that uh or there's some certain times there's other podcasts that are, are a bit more dedicated to science and then you get to talk a little bit longer about stuff but I think this this format that you have going is, is cool. It really gets it gets gets people thinking a bit more and a little bit deeper about some subjects, and then kind of hopefully inspires some ideas out there and kind of resonates. So I think it's uh, I I choose to listen to this format the most because I think it's it is it's it's the most fascinating. I think. I think it's really popular with the introverts and the scientist types, uh, not as much with the um, younger um, generation, you know, who mostly would like to have the five to 10 minutes of, you know, really. Um, yeah, I guess so. Day. And you wonder what's lost in that, you know, um, where is society going where we have, <laughs> we can't think about something for more than five to 10 minutes uh, until there could be, you know, so certain things happen, um, memes or what they call them or, uh, where you have these societies that change, but not always for the benefit of society, right? So maybe that's not a good thing that we're, that we're going, going in that direction. But I'm glad that, you know, you're still there, you're keeping it real, and we're going to hopefully bring others on with us. So cool. <laughs> kind of bastion of the last. Uh, yeah, bastion, yeah, just we're, no, we'll fight through, we'll make it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Greg, you haven't been that famous um, as always. Like um, there was time when you and Tim were working as graduate students and you started working on this um, interface. Um, I heard your Frankfurt TED talk. Uh, we talked a little bit about your history and how the idea actually came. Just walk us through and what inspired you to um, work. Yeah, so, uh, and it's funny because I, I, I probably like many people, um, I didn't choose the right career in the beginning. And so I was... I didn't know what I wanted to be like, and I went to school as a no pref student, which is kind of unheard of probably nowadays where I just didn't declare what I wanted to be. Um, and the, through that process, I kind of found that I kind of like science, but I, I was really kind of fascinated by electricity. And so I went and chose a career in electrical engineering. And I did that for about a decade. And then I, uh, I kind of realized that wasn't quite it. I mean, it wasn't, it was okay. I was doing it. I was developing a PCB board and I was really excited about that. And then I had to develop the next PCB board and I was less excited about the next one because it was just kind of turning the crank a bit in my mind it was. Um, so then I started to think about what were the things that really in, I enjoyed in life. Uh, and it was around this time, I remember I had a, I had a conversation with, my boss, I was living in Europe. I was in, uh, based out of Amsterdam and I was, I think I was living for a year in London and my boss there was trying to get me to move from engineering into management. And he was saying, Hey, Greg, man, you don't want to be carrying around a toolbox the rest of your life. You want to, you know, you want to come in and, and make the real money. And I kept thinking like, why wouldn't I want to carry a toolbox around the rest of my life? And it's funny because I, I still carry a toolbox around now. You know, it's always like the worst thing he could have said to me. But I, and I, I realized later that that problem uh, has been resolved in many companies where they have you know a technical track and an and a management track where you can excel in both. But in the company that I was at, you can only excel in the management track. And I was I, I knew that I want to be close to the technical stuff. I thought I was very curious and interested in how things worked. Um, and so then I thought about for a while, what would be the ultimate job where you could just be a nerd and kind of be rewarded for it and sort of have upward mobility. I was like, well, I'll be a professor. A professor seems like a cool job. It looks like you just do research and you could be, you know, just doing what you want to do and then creating knowledge and then kind of getting rewarded for that. So, so I, I quit my job and I moved back to 
to uh, grad school. And so, um, and then when I was looking for grad schools uh, in, in that period, I stumbled across a neuroscience lab um, and I was blown away by this. I mean, I, I was, I mean, I was an electrical engineer. I was developing, you know, motherboards with CPUs on it. And I knew how memory worked. I knew how everything worked. Yeah. I knew nothing about my own body. Right. And so I, I and I popped into a, a neuroscience lab and I heard for the first time uh, a rat with a, an electrode placed into it. So it was in his motor cortex. And every time it would turn its neck, I heard this, I this, it was on the oscilloscope, this beautiful spike train. I'm like, what, what is that? And they go, oh, that's the neuron, you know, that's recording, the recording from the uh, motor cortex and they were creating a brain machine interface. And I was like, wait a minute, what do you mean that's a neuron? What is a neuron? And I was like asking all these questions and I'm, here I am an old man already. You know, I've been, I've been out of school for like a decade. I knew nothing about this stuff. And it dawned on me that, that there was this entire computer that I just never thought about that was in my brain and it was doing electrical properties, things that I just studied for the last, you know, 20 years. And I, I was like, man, this is it. This is what I want to do. And so then I, I kind of jumped. So I quit my job after I said that moment of real realization. And then I, uh, yeah, I came back and I joined that lab. I was the neural engineering lab at the university of Michigan, uh, was the first, first place I, I heard a neuron in this, the, Thing that kind of stuck with me for the rest of my life. And so when I joined the lab, um, my lab mate, uh, Tim Marzullo was, and, and Colin, another lab mate of ours, were going out to school to talk about, you know, neuroscience to kids. And I'm like, well, crap, man, I want to get on that because, you know, I missed the boat. I missed 20 years wasting my life on other stuff because I didn't know about this. And so I need to be like a you know, uh, uh, to apostolize the, the brain, right. To get out there and talk about it. And so, uh, we were going into fourth and fifth grade classrooms and we were doing stuff with, um, you know, various things like optical illusions or, you know, we did some experiments. We would put like prism goggles on and you have to throw a ball and the ball would go one way. And then your, you know, your brain would adapt to it. And then you take your prism goggles off and the ball goes the other way when you're trying to throw into a hole and, you know, this type of stuff, but it wasn't as cool. It was, they're kind of cool. I mean, they're all, everything you talk about the brain, I think is kind of interesting, but it wasn't as interesting as that experience I had with that spike, with seeing that neuron popping and understanding that that was reality. You know, the, everything that you ever thought or imagined all came from this, this neuron, this popping spiking sound that was crackling across the, the screen there. And so uh, it was a ride around, that time that we uh that my colleague tim and i who were in the same lab had this idea that what if we could produce you know uh so so the question is why 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 is there no neuroscience in, in schools right and so we came up with the with the rationalization that the reason why is that it's perceived to be hard you know it's like rocket science and brain surgery are the kind of the classic uh like <laughs> taboo things that we don't touch, right? So it's perceived to be hard, so they don't really push that hard to get it. But then also the tools required to do, you know, brain surgery and putting neuron uh, to, to record from neurons are pretty expensive. So I had a big rack of equipment and it cost $80,000. And I wasn't able to convince my PI to push the cart out into my car and then bring it into the classroom and then show them how neurons worked, right? And so uh, it was right around this time, um, uh, about you know 10 11 years ago that uh we had the idea of of doing something about it we were going to record it was a self-imposed engineering challenge um it was right around the time of the olpc like these kind of the hundred dollar laptop i don't know if you remember this stuff that was coming out um uh, of mit and so the uh so we had we had this idea of a hundred dollar spike could we record a spike which is a which is the output of a neuron uh, for under a hundred bucks. And so we wrote it as an abstract for a scientific um, conference, the largest neuroscience conference in the world, about uh, 30,000 neuroscientists show up, about 40,000 people in general. Um, and they all come once a year for about a week uh, to study the brain together and learn from each other's posters and presentations and stuff like that. And so we said, all right, well, we're going to submit an abstract to there. And the abstract basically just said, you know, um, we're going to try to attempt to 
record a spike for under 100 bucks, you know, stop by our poster uh, in the fall and see how we did, you know, we'll see, we'll see if we made progress or not. All right. Cause then the thing is right around now, like in, in the spring is when you submit those abstracts and the, and the conference isn't until late fall, like almost into winter. And so we had all summer along. And so the summer went by, we were making little inroads. I know how to build circuits because of my previous career. Uh, Tim knew a lot about the biology and figured out that the type of neurons we wanted to record from should be invertebrates. So we don't have to get, you know, a special license from the, from the government to be able to perform, you know, surgeries on rats is what we were doing in the lab. And so, uh, so that was kind of the big, the big turning point was understanding that we could use inverts like, uh, like crickets and cockroaches and stuff like that. Uh, and then if you would have come by the poster, in the fall of that year, uh, you would have seen sort of Tim and I standing in front of uh, a big table with all of our prototypes on there and it, and it worked. And then we had this flip chart that had all of our receipts on there and we were kind of showing off that we could do this for under hundred bucks. And we were not intending to <clears throat> you know, start a company or do anything like that. We were just kind of being you know, hipsters, kind of showing off what we did over the summer, that type of thing. But I think because it had the hundred dollar price tag in there, uh, people kept asking us, you know, can we buy one? You know, and so, oh, the other thing was we we didn't. Uh, this is that was the fourth or fifth poster that we did that was outside of our our normal research, and so we gotten pretty good at sort of presenting things a bit a bit satirically, and so uh, we would present things. For example, uh, a few years before that, the. Uh, rats controlling the stock market. So we were making fun of fMRI, which was a big, a big um, thing at that time. Uh, it's kind of chilled out since then. But the, but there was like every other uh, paper in in science, the top journals, right, were these fMRI papers, kind of repeating some of the old experiments and kind of showing, oh, it's this part of the brain lights up when when I move my hand. Therefore, this part of the brain must move, like uh, must be controlling this hand, right? So all these neural correlations between things, and we were noticing that some of the papers were not doing the right statistical corrections, right? The uh, Bonferroni corrections, and so we made our very first satirical poster by taking all of the rat data that we were collecting over the past three months. And then correlated that rat data with the stock market. And we're treating the stock market like voxels, like in, a, in an fMRI paper. And then we would have these rats. Uh, we would do the same statistical analysis that were done in fMRI papers using our rats and stock market. And we could find, we could find these correlations. And we would find these, these very spurious correlations of like, you know, the financial sector seemed to be really responsive to when the rats firing rates were going up or down. And so then we made this whole theory about this Gaia hypothesis that the entire world is a living organism. And to, you know, to test this hypothesis, we're going to take two completely different things, you know, homo sapien, uh, you know, uh, advanced trading um, and of, of goods and wares, and then firing rates from rats. And it, they should be connected if the entire world. And so we did this thing and, and made a bit of a joke post around. And so uh, people would stop by and about a third of the people didn't get the joke. Um, about a third of people got the joke and, and thought it was hilarious because they thought it was kind of silly what was going on with the, some of the fMRI stuff. And then about a third of people got the joke and realized the joke was on them and would argue. And it was fun. So we had this. <laughs> so we kind of had a, a, a every year we were getting larger and larger crowds because uh, we would do another. The next one we did one on um, it was a this thing within neuroscience, the grandmother cell hypothesis. I don't know if it's how many neurons do you have to have to hold the memory? Is it is it every memory have a neuron or does is is it just the timing of specific cells? And so we did this. We had a whole bunch of back envelopes and we we're calculating. You know how old you were. You could cal you could calculate how many memories you have at that day, and we could show that there were not enough neurons in your brain to store your memories. And if you only did spike timing, then you only needed like 10 neurons to code every memory that was ever existed in the universe. So like, it's probably a combination of the both. So like. Yeah. So anyway, we we're getting kind of better at kind of presenting these kind of far out there ideas that were that were legitimate ideas, right? But we did it in a in a way that was a bit more, I don't know, accessible to people. That it, it would you would you would draw bigger crowds. We found that if you use satire a little bit rather than just hitting them hard with stats, right? And so then 
Uh, and then people would come up and we would, we would even modify the post because someone, some of the people would come by, they'd have better ideas and we'd rip out apart and just and redo the poster. Cause so it was kind of a crowdsource idea. And so by the time we got to this uh, spiker box, we already had a big crowd. So we had maybe like a hundred people waiting for us to come show this poster off. And so, uh, and so we presented it for a few and then someone from the journal nature was walking by and they see this big crowd around this poster and they're looking in there and we had the, Oh, and so we, we didn't just talk about a low cost one channel um, bio amplifier for recording spikes for education. That would have been a very boring title. So the, uh, so we, we pitched it as the cure for the zombie apocalypse. And we're saying that if you were, uh, you know, surviving the zombie apocalypse and maybe your loved ones have turned into zombies and they're trying to eat your brains. Right. And so you've got them locked away and you want to help cure that disease, obviously a neurological disorder, right? Their, their behavior has changed. So therefore that must be something to do with their brain and you want to do research on it, but you know, all the vendors have turned into zombies. Right. And so you need to figure out a way to, to build the equipment yourself. And so these are the blueprints that you can break into Radio Shack at night, take the raw components and put it together to build this kit to record from the brain. So that was the shtick that we used to kind of introduce the Spucker Box to the world. And it worked. And so we had this big crowd and this lady from the Journal Nature stops by and was asking, like, was kind of blown away that this thing actually worked and stuff like that. And then we did an interview for the Neuropod podcast. Uh, this is like about 11 years ago. And then everything changed after that, because then, you know, I, I've been publishing some high profile papers, like in, in kind of fancy journals, like in Cell and, and stuff like that. And so the, but not once when I published a paper, did someone say, hey, Greg, man, I really love that fast spiking inner neuron paper you have. Hey, uh, keep up the good work because I think it's really important that we understand that microarchitecture to better understand decision making. So, man, this, you're awesome, man. Keep it going. But like, not once did that happened. But this stupid side project with the cockroach and the uh, the low budget thing, I, I, we were getting these emails like like twice a day, I, and it was just like ding, like, hey, man, just heard that podcast. I just read your about your thing in Nature. You know, I, it, it's such a cool idea. I want to buy one and stuff like that. And so then. It took maybe about a month of this. Uh, it's funny because the I was studying the basal ganglia, right? The the parts of the dopamine systems that kind of, when you get rewards, sort of change your behaviors. Right? And so, like I've experienced this in real time. I'm like, hey, wait a minute, man! This little stupid side project that I was doing might be it might be where the real fun is, right? And so maybe at some point. And so uh, we decided at that time that we're going to start a company around this idea of this of this project and so we talked to the you know the center for entrepreneurship we won a hundred dollar grant uh maybe it was 500 bucks i can't remember we we spent it immediately on parts to buy to build up more of these things and so then uh yeah slowly grew that way and then we sold all the ones that we had and then people were paying us money and we were buying it more it was everything was it's very kind of um you know, bootstrap type company. Uh, and so I was still in, like, I was still years away from graduating from school. And so um, we, Tim graduated and then he got a fellowship to do an entrepreneurship thing. So he learned a lot about entrepreneurship. And it's funny, we went out to, uh, I remember at that time we went out to Google. We never took ourselves too seriously, as you can, if you can guess by the zombie apocalypse. And so we, one time we went out to Google, we won a pitch competition because we could pitch really well. We were, we were really good at that, but the product kind of sucked. It was like this thing to record from cockroaches. So like, uh, so the entrepreneurship world didn't quite know what to do with us. And so I remember we went to Google for, uh, we won a trip to pitch um, our stuff to investors. And the very first year, we were very serious about it. Like, okay, guys, you know, rolling up our sleeves, showing them the cockroach stuff. And they're just like, uh, uh no way like good luck boys you know that type of stuff and so the funny thing is we won it we won the same contest the second year because i was still in grad school and we went back and now we knew a lot more about about how entrepreneurship works about like these stupid term sheets and and all the deals and stuff like that and so and we already knew that they were going to laugh us off the stage right and so we so the first thing we did the second time we went out there to completely new panel 
we kind of walked out there with these big stacks of paper and we were handing them out at the beginning of the talk. We're like, all right, this is the, these are the deals. Like we gave them the term sheets. If you go to page 14, you're going to see you guys get preferred stock. We can negotiate the, you know, the percentages a little bit. And the guy like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, what am I signing here? They're getting all really angry at us. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we just want to get it out of the way first. Cause when you, when you're about to see what's about to happen, you're going to want to sign that thing, you know? So, uh, so then we came out and showed them the cockroach thing. And there was one, I remember there was one VC guy on the panel. The rest were kind of just kind of high business people, whatever, maybe from Google or some of that. But they were all kind of upset with what, like they didn't get it. They didn't get the joke, but the VC guy got the joke and loved it, man. He was, and he signed it because he found some claws in there that would get, that give him, get him out of it. I don't know, but he had some fun. So anyway, and then, and then I remember at one point we got, um, because it was our second time there, we were just kind of, um, milling around. Like, I didn't want to, we didn't want to go through the same talks again about, you know, there were good talks. So it was like talking about Henry Ford and how, how visionary he was, but having gone through it the year before we kind of s- snuck out. And I remember at, we were in the Google cafeteria trying to poach people to come work for us. You're like, Hey man, do you want to, you know, categorize the world's information for the rest of your life? You want to change the world, you know, <laughs> so we're like showing up the cockroach thing and like try to, and then finally the security came and grabbed us and pulled us back out into the group. <laughs> it's like, we got escorted out of Google at that same time of starting up back our brain. It's kind of funny story, but yeah, so those are the early days. Uh, and um, so we finally did get uh, something off the ground. So we, we were, Still selling things. I, I remember I was I was dropping my postdoc. I, I was a. Uh, I finally finished grad school in in 2010, and I did uh, a postdoc for about 10. percent I just wanted to get some health insurance because we were actually starting to make money off of this this spiker box stuff. Not a lot. I mean, just barely enough to eat and pay rent. But the um, but it was a start. And then I remember we wrote at that time we wrote a whole bunch of grants like um, as scientists tend to do, and so we wrote. Uh, uh, some for the Department of Education, trying to convince them. Um, we did one for just another, just a, like a biomedical engineering one. And I remember we made a video once, and this becomes important in a minute. So we had to make a video for one of the projects, um, uh, the grants that we were doing. And it was like Tim sitting there all sad. And I came in like, why are you sad, Tim? I want to do neuroscience, but I can't afford it. You know, like, hey, have you tried this? And I had this. So it was like a little stupid commercial about this, about this idea of recording spikes for cheap. And we put it up on YouTube and attached it to this, this grant that we never got, right? And so then uh, little did we know that many, many years later, uh, someone at the NIH was sitting at a desk and was told, you need to figure out a way to bring education into neuroscience. And he was going through YouTube and found that video and said, hey, that's a pretty good idea for a grant and wrote this grant up that was almost identical to what we were doing right and, and we read this grant like holy crap I mean we stopped everything we're like oh my god it's like they it's like they read our minds and they put it on paper and now we can get money to do this thing and so we basically stopped everything worked on that grant for nonstop and this is the biggest grant we've ever written right it was like uh about 80 pages of like just stuff and like uh, forms that you need to get filled up. We figured out how to do all that stuff and we submitted it and we got, we got funded. And so, and it wasn't until about three or four years later that I heard the story that that guy actually found our video and helped it, helped him kind of create the grant. But that, that little chance thing, which, which tells you sometimes you got to make your own luck, right? You have to get yourself out there to be discovered, to be able to do that and to be able to and to change things for the future. Um, I also never got into grad school. I, that was, producing my own luck as well. So you have to sometimes get out there and, and, and do it yourself. Right. But anyway, so we got that funding and when that funding hit, everything changed. Then I could, I could quit my job as a postdoc in this work full time. Remember we, we hired somebody to help us pack the boxes. That was the first thing It was like our, our highest priority was <laughs> figure out how to get these things in there. Uh, but yeah, that, and then it, that started uh, a whole chain of things. And so we started with this simple thing of recording neurons um, on, with cockroaches. And then the second product we released was a cyborg, uh, the world's first and still the only commercially available cyborg in the history of mankind. It's kind of cool. Uh, so that's a backpack you put on a cockroach and you can connect to it over Bluetooth, low energy, and you 
can drive. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that um, have, has recently uh, emerged uh, from our friendly neighbor, Elon Musk, you know, they have started a company called Neuralink, um, in which uh, they've taught uh, monkeys to play uh, video games. And I'm a huge skeptic of that. I mean, that might technically be possible, but um, do you have any idea if EMG would be a better solution for that or uh, something you've tried? Yeah, I mean, I think... Break your brains? Um... Yeah, I think the the problem that Elon Musk is trying to address is this thing I, I was mentioning earlier about the you know the EEG it's a it's a bandwidth issue right it's a we can't get enough information out of the brain just by recording from the outside and I mean obviously his concern is AI when AI gets to be you know super powerful but more uh, smarter than a human then we're, we're going to be having this arms race against that. And, they, and in order to be able to work with these machines in the future, we have to be, you know, communicating at the same speed of these machines. And so the idea was EEG is not going to cut it from our brain. So we have to, we're going to have to go in a little bit deeper. Right. And so I think um, his long-term goal, I, I, I suspect is not on motor prosthetics and that might be their, their starting solutions for that. But I do think that the um, the the at least with, with what they're doing. So so let's let's talk about what they've done. And they they just did a demo not that long ago, and they did do so. They did show off some couple of cool things. I think the coolest thing they they showed off was how they're implanting these electrodes. And now they have that you know they have a scanning electron microscope that's looking for the vasculature. That's one one of the biggest problems we have with brain machine interface. And that's what I did my PhD on. That was like my, my uh in those early works with darpa um uh working on figuring out ways to control devices from the body right um so what we found out uh by doing this was that the uh, they would work you can you can control robotic limbs fairly well and i was even doing in rodents i had rodents controlling things to be able to eat and stuff like that so it was a very very uh a fairly stable technology we had enough of the statistical science there to be able to interpret what do these neurons mean and, and to turn it into a control signals but one of the biggest problems that was never solved in my life in the lab and when i switched out to do, to do something else was chronic recordings when you place electrodes inside the cortex and you leave them sit there for many many months to years right what happens is that this is a rigid wire inside the brain. And as this micro fluctuations happen in the brain, you start to build up scars around this thing. And the scars come over, these glial cells come over and they encapsulate the electrode to the point where you can no longer record. So the, it was kind of a boring engineering problem in the end that, that kind of was the, the downfall for all these uh, cool technologies that were coming out. And so, what what took me away about those what Elon Musk was doing is that he's kind of solving that hard problem, right? So he's looking at well, what causes the what causes the inflammation, right? And so it, it's the maybe the bursting of micro blood vessels that are doing that to cause the, the original tears, right? And that and that's that starts this, this entire process. And so uh, I think they're showing a way that they're using this really expensive but amazing uh, equipment that places the electrodes in the brain by scanning ahead and looking to see where all the vasculature is and then moving the, neuro the, the electrodes around those. And so the idea is that you get this electrode that's kind of perfectly floating. It's also neural laces of these really thin kind of movable electrodes that are inside. So I think that was the biggest takeaway that I got out of what they're what he's working on and so that's the that's the entry level that's how you get the well i might be totally naive about this question but i'm still wondering um do we have some solutions from nanomaterials for example we use heart stunts also once you have a cardiac issue you know you put stunts into that and that is, is something that you have that has to fit um into your um ecosystem to be able to work and i was just wondering do we have some material that would focus on that problem you know the scarring problem yeah so that yeah so there is um i remember it's like that's what my my i was in the neural engineering lab and everybody and their brother was coming up with new ways new technologies that we could do uh to to be able to make this thing you know flexible new, new materials new coatings and so i remember uh, my lab mate Kip was was developing this soft coating that would go over this really th 
thin piece of silicon that would be wrapped with up at this uh, P dot. It would make this fuzzy kind of soft surface that would you could slide it in. So like people are looking at a whole bunch of different technologies that allow that. Some go in and the the scaffolding on it melts away, and so all that's left are just little, very tiny, uh, you know. Recept uh, little electrodes, basically with little gold leaves that kind of go back up to the surface. And so, uh, yeah, I feel like the electrode part may have been solved for a while, but the the surgical implantation had been perhaps. And well, I'll see what the data looks like from from these experiments that he's developed. Maybe it turns out to be the same. Um, but I think it's still too early to tell what's what's going on with Elon Musk company. But the what's funny and like a lot of those people. I used to work with like, and actually the guy who's in charge of the animal study, the uh, flip sabies was my brother. Uh, he was, he was uh, uh, under the same PI as me from, from earlier. And so, uh, and also a uh, number of my grad school friends are there. So the, um, anyway, I, I, so I feel like it's a continuation of what we were doing earlier. It's just the technology is, is pushed on. I mean, the technology as far as this robotic insertion device. The other thing they did, they, they did shrink down. So one of the things was active electronics. And so the historically, you would put wires into the brain. And then like I always had everything on the outside of the brain, like these big things here that would stick in. And then you'd have the wires coming up there. But then it was funny because uh, people would stop by and see my experiments and the rats would have literally 81 wires coming out of the brain and it's getting, and I have to stop like the experiment and untwist the wires and plug them back in. Like everyone would stop by like, Hey man, have you thought about wireless? I'm like, Oh no, I never thought about that. You know, thank you, dude. That's a really good idea. I'm like, of course I thought about it, but it's just like the, the problem with wireless has always been, there's, there's so much information there. It, it's like uh, the bandwidth of these neurons are really, really big. And you have, you know, you got, you've got, you know, maybe I was having about a hundred, I think, you know, it's about a thousand, but that was the other thing they cracked. They figured out, I mean, and it, again, I think in that number, it may be big. I know um, Miguel Nicolaelis at Duke had done wireless recordings for monkeys, you know, almost a decade before. So, I mean, that there's a lot of things that are not new. I guess maybe it's the, the combination of them, but I think it's also the number and they shrunk down the electronics a bit more. So I think mean, they are making progress. I wouldn't say it's like, um, revolutionary progress but it's just kind of it's just what you'd expect it's kind of like linear progress towards the goal right I think so let's get into what he's doing e yeah we have eeg and ecg which are wireless that we can actually use but results are kind of mixed um what you can get out of that but what i'm more concerned about is the fact uh i mean of course like you said it, it's not groundbreaking I mean, it's been out there for quite some time but what I'm interested in is that how do you actually um, use those action potentials um, and guide the behaviors of monkey to actually play video games? I mean, that part is yeah, that, know, that part. So fiction. that yeah, that part is actually not that hard. So this, so it turns out that it, depending on where you place the electrodes, um, you can uh, you can get that fairly easily. And so there's how a, does that work? Place it, it that. Yeah, so I'll walk you through. So so there's a part of your brain that is design for volitional control right that's your motor cortex very similar to the emg it's just two synapses back right so you're up here in the in that little strip that well, goes down that your part ear. i get from your ted talk that you know you can uh, move your wrist and you know um you can um, right see and, that. So, and so but what they're so what, what i'm trying to ask is that you know how do you actually um, connect it with what monkey is seeing on the screen you know moving it um, the ball. Yeah, so so you need a decoding algorithm. So what you do is then you take the and so you let's say you you drop an electrode in there, and every time the monkey, just like the very first thing I saw with it within my lab was when the rat moved its neck. I heard this popping across the screen, right? And so when the um you you drop it randomly in the motor cortex of the monkey, and then when he ever randomly moves, maybe his thumb, you'll get these beautiful recordings across here. And so maybe in the beginning. The monkey thinks that, hey, every time I move my thumb, this pong thing is going up and down, right? And so he may just be playing it with his thumb. Um, and he doesn't know anything different. He's just uh, he's just trying to control this thing. He understands the game, right? But now he's controlling the thing with his with it just by moving. And maybe it's, it's maybe it's his shoulder. He think just by trial and error, you can figure out how to control this thing. Cause if you just if you did hook it up to something in your body. And I didn't tell you what it was. It would take you about a minute to figure out how to control that thing, right? So it's 
that part is pretty well done. And they, and that was what my, that was my dissertation was on that. How do you take, and so what you do is you completely randomize all the weights and then you allow it just to learn from watching the neurons at that, at the moment, uh, if it's supposed to be going up, which neurons look like it's going up, you know, it's supposed to be going down, which look like they're going down or the opposite. Right. And so there's ways that you can, you can create a tuning curve automatically in an algorithm that will match the neurons to, to maximize the ability to move that thing. So that they chose Pong. That's a one degree of freedom that's up and down. Right. Uh, the next thing would be is a two degrees of freedom, you know, you know, drawing something on the screen, for example, and they do that with, with human patients right now, but the, so this is the very, this is the hello world of brain machine interfaces, the one degree of freedom game that the monkey does. And so the monkey just learns, he learns to play the game first, then they do the implant. And actually, I don't even know if they did learn to play the game. I'm assuming that's how they did it. And then, oh, they have to train the monkey to sit in a chair and do all this stuff anyway. And so I'm sure they played the game millions of times before they put the implant in. Then he knows what he has to do. And now he just has to figure out how to control it. And since part of his body controls it right now with the neurons, he can easily figure that out. And then after time, let's say I was, he was moving his hand like this to control it. And then over time, he learns not to move his hand because it's takes a lot more energy than just controlling those neurons. And then at some point in the future, so they call it the cursor cortex. So they, there's a, there's these classic papers from the nineties where um, uh, they call it the cursor cortex, where you play an electrode in the motor cortex, you, you wait a while and they learn to control things on the, the cursor on the screen. And then the beginning, they're thinking about moving their toe and moving their shoulder to move it left and right and the up and down. But then about a month in, they said, all right, well, you know, click on this thing and spell out, you know, so they'll spell things out and they'll say like, how did you know how to do that? And they said, well, I just thought about moving it and it moved. So it, I, we can use neural plasticity of the brain to sort of create a, an external object that we can control. And we just think about controlling it and it just starts to move. Right. So that's what the motor cortex is really designed to do is to kind of take uh, a bunch of little smaller micro motions and connect them together into a, into a kind of this, this, um, this motion. Uh, and then we learn to do that. We get better at that motion. And so then it turns out that you, that motion can also be on a computer screen you know, or, but the other thing I think what I find fascinating about what Elon Musk wants to do, he wants to, he wants to tap into more of like kind of the, the limbic system and more of these other not motor. So, so brain machine interfaces, historically has been motor control right but what if i understand correctly what he's talking about is more on the hippocampus so that being able to be able to use like we can only remember 10 numbers right and that sucks i mean why can't we you know a computer can easily hold 10 numbers and a million numbers right why why can our brain only hold 10 so but what if what if we could sort of tap in to an electrode that could reach out into the cloud, right? And use AI to sort of store those other numbers and we can recall them later on, right? And so then maybe we could understand, everyone could just really understand quantum mechanics or like, you know, really complex mathematics without much thought or reason, right? I mean, you just kind of just feel about it. And I think when, when you get to that, that's where it starts sounding a little bit more like, a, a, a religion uh something that requires yeah, a lot that, of leaps of getting faith into supernatural things uh, for yeah example, and that and that, thing is that you know in experimental psychology um you know it's marvelous the kind of things that you can teach um in animals like rats um and cats and bats um and um other rodents um and especially in the video if you look at the video um in which the monkey is playing the game you know he the monkey gets um, reward um, um, a banana smoothie through a um, a straw, yeah, a straw and, tube. And that is for me. That's a simple experimental psychology. It has nothing to do with neuroscience. You know, this it makes it very hard to understand what is exactly what's going on. I mean, a paper would be really nice. Yeah, but I think I mean the those papers have already been out, right? So I think they're um, that was kind of interesting about being in a company. Like you don't give a shit about papers anymore, right? But the, but it does suck because then you want to know about that stuff. But fortunately, that there's there is a ton of literature about that how the, how that works. And you're right. I mean, it's like um, I mean the fact that the monkey's sitting in chair. Monkeys don't sit in chairs. You don't find monkeys sitting. It's like the fact that he's sitting there means he's already. 
you know, he's decided that this is how I'm going to get my food. Right. So there's all this weird stuff, even before the experiment starts. And it does take a long time. I know a lot of my colleagues train these monkeys to sit in chairs, right? And they spend a year doing uh, monkeys that. Are um, like, All right, let's get it done in the orbit. <laughs> yeah. And certain monkeys, do, they don't feel like working a certain day and they won't. And so, I mean, it's, um, yeah, but I think you you have to have, um, because we can't talk directly to the monkey, you have to have a, a language in which we can tell them what to do. And that was through this food reward system. They give them a little bit of, banana milkshake and then they they go they work for it but it yeah so there is um but i guess the idea would be this is a stand-in for a human that you don't need to do that for that they would sit in the chair because they want to sit in the chair and they would do it because they really want to do that right it's we can't tell the monkey how important this is going to be for humanity if you want to do that so we have to do some whatever tricks we can do for right now so that part doesn't concern me as much what concerns me is that idea that but i guess you have to ask those questions uh, and, and can that be done? And there's only I, Ted Berger is doing something um, about making an artificial hippocampus. Have you know much about this? So he has this uh, chip that he wants to implant, like for, you know, people who have Alzheimer's is it could be the misfiring of the hippocampal neurons. And so he's trying to build a little AI that can sit and watch for patterns coming in and the patterns coming out. And then when the patterns don't come out again, you can artificially fire these things to sort of restore these memories and stuff like that. So that, that research has been going on for about a decade at least. Um, and so I think there's, there, are, there is some, you know, some working going on outside of this motor cortex brain machine interface, but it's, it's in the early stages. So I think, I think the fact that he wants to do that, I think would be cool. I hope he does publish papers on that because I think that would be uh, important to know for the rest of, us right uh about how the brain works. it'd be helpful for ai as well uh yeah i mean talking about ai actually you know uh, let's connect it to humans and how it can actually be beneficial for um, yeah. a lot of people um, with disabilities um you've seen already in the youtube original series um on ai uh where um team at georgia tech um is helping people or amputees uh, get a, a prosthetic arm um, and what it does is it actually um uses the um, nerves from um, the amputated part uh, or let's say the remaining part of your arm and then it guides um, your prosthetic um, fingers yeah. uh, to move yeah this is and i was just wondering have you had personal experience with that yeah so we do so that problem like uh, the skywalker arm project uh was funded in the same when i was doing the work for darpa they were funded as well so i got to i got to know them in the early days and they were using emg i think originally um, and what you find out fairly quickly, uh, so EMGs, let me just describe what that is. That's like the motor cortex. The only way the brain communicates with the outside world is through the motor cortex. And that's through me speaking or through, uh, you know, me punching you or running away or these types of ways that the brain communicates with the outside world, right? So this motor cortex of ours projects down to the spinal cord, um, comes out to our muscles and we can record fairly easily the electricity from the brain as it gets amplified by the muscles we call it the electromyogram or emg and so in the uh the skywalker arm if i remember correctly they're either you cuff electrodes or electrodes to be able to record that electricity to to figure out how to do fine motor movements in a hand and what do you find out early on is that the emg is not a really good i mean it's a good control signal but more of an on off switch right um there's not a lot of nuances within it. It's this big eruption of, of voltage and it, it drains away and it kind of expands further. So you need a lot more electrodes at further a spot. So you have less, you know, accuracy. And so what that team has figured out was, which I think is pretty clever, is that instead of using EMG, uh, they're looking at, uh, you know, using some uh, ultrasound to dig, to go deep into the tissue to watch what the EMG is actually doing. And so you know, if I'm moving my finger, you can actually see it on your arm right here. There's a, there's a little bit of a twitch on the, on the muscle right down here, right, for that one. And so what they figured out was that instead of getting something that has this large signal that erupts everywhere, this EMG across this big muscle, if you could watch that muscle and you can get very, very careful. Uh, you can start to understand a little bit more about what each muscle does in the arm just by looking at it. Yeah, so they have a little ultrasound sensor on there and they're kind of recording 
by taking a picture of what's going on, the muscle behind it, and they can do some amazing stuff. They can actually really map out well to continue that signal to where it should have gone and actually make the prosthetic hand do that. So uh, we, we're interested in that way. So this is one of the ones we're doing for the summer. We're building a prosthetic hand, just like a DIY for, for education that's going to have the exact same type of uh, technology, right? We're not going to use ultrasound. We're going to start with the EMG, but I, we may switch over to using ultrasound sensing because I think that's a, that's a clever idea. And I think that's a, I think we can do that fairly cheap too. So it'd be kind of fun way to, to sort of see how that goes. So I think the, the entire world is blowing up. I mean, you're, you're obviously aware of it, but with um, this deep learning, right, right around uh, 2014, I saw things changing uh, and it's, it is rapidly accelerating. And if I teach this course, it called the methods of computational neuroscience in Woods Hole. And right around, I've been teaching that since 2010. Um, it's one of the top uh, kind of AI courses uh, or computational neuroscience courses that they get poached from there to, to go into AI, uh, all these grad students from Stanford and MIT and stuff like that. But the, I noticed about five years ago, six years ago that, the students were tending to know a bit more than the professors were knowing. These are the world's experts in, in like deep neural networks, stuff like that. And then, yeah, some people were asking questions about, like they were telling, oh, you can't overfit your data and stuff like that. And one of the students would raise their hand like, well, you know, that's not quite true anymore. And then, no, 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 that's still true. And then other raised like, no, actually Facebook has shown that you can do this. Like, and then I, and I was like sitting in the back of the room, like really, like, wow, there, there's something happening right now where the industry is knowing much more than academics do about this particular topic that has been relished only to academia for like the last 40 years. Right. So look out. And so, yeah. And yeah, then don't right get after started that, about academia, well, you know, it's it's lagging yeah. years behind industry. It is know? lagging years behind and the industry. The, so, and the, and the sad part is that you know they still think that they are best at everything, which is kind of just our ivory tower. You know, I'm very yeah, disillusioned no, no. about that. But let's not talk about that. Um, let's talk about something um, fun. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the AI robot um, Sophia. Um, you know, it's been traveling around the world. Saudi Arabia actually gave it the nationality uh, for some reason. You know, it uses AI to respond to people. And uh, I had on my show uh, Greg um, Coquillo. He is a, pro a product manager at uh, Amazon and um, a top voice in um, AI and data science. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, it sounds for a human being still a very robotic uh, for some reason. I mean, even though the voice is pretty good, um, the answers are understandable. Tony Robbins had a conversation with Sophie and really liked it. One of the things that we discussed that, you know, we could use probably in Sophia's face, some kind of facial nerves that are activated um, when certain emotion actually arises. And we were talking about limbic system earlier. Um, so far, what you've done in your experiment and TED talk, um, and it's very engaging the ability of sensory motor um, nerves and how we could use EMG um, to uh, understand how our uh, motor systems work. But how can we incorporate that in uh, robots to make it more realistic? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, that's the next phase. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, I did, a, I did a thing with Ted this summer on emotional AI. It's, I, I, I uh, spent a number of months just doing, going back to the original research on this stuff. And it's, it's quite fascinating because I think it works well for robots, right? So if you look at where emotions come from, emotions, uh, Charles Darwin wrote this book on, uh, on the behaviors of man and animals. Um, uh, the, uh, the expression of behaviors of man and animals so about the expression of how we feel emotionally. Right. Uh, and what he, what he came up with were these, it was right. It was right after he published um, the, his famous book. Right. But this, this book was so fascinating because it looks at, for example, the things we take for granted, you know, when we're thinking about something, we tend to squint our eyes. Like, hmm, you know, we do that. Like, why do we do that? And so it turns out, that behaviors, expressives, expressions of behaviors evolve from, from useful things that happen when you're experiencing something. So for example, if you were on a tree and you were trying to figure out if that monkey coming towards you is a friend or an enemy, that's an important decision to make, right? And so you would squint your eyes so you could see what that thing was, right? To see it better on the horizon. And that thing started so it started off as a as a, a, a 
normal response to something that was happening. And then over generations, that becomes a habit. You, you habitually will do that. Then over many generations, it becomes instinct. So you can look at all these things. Like, why do we close our eyes when we're opening up a can of jar? You know, you look at, um, you know, why do we smile and frown? All these things all have some type of a connection to, uh, to some e previous point in history where that actually made sense. Like, why does the hair stand up on the back of our head, you know, when we're scared? Because previous animals would puff themselves out to look bigger, right? There's all these cool things. So yeah, so that it turns out that, the, that you, uh, and there's, and there's all these other rules, right? So there's, there's a, a linear thing. So like your expression is always either one direction or the other. You're either bit, you get bigger or you get smaller and there, there's your eyes dilate or they get, so they're always 180 from each other and they will be the opposite of each other at the opposite dimension of that expression. So if like you're happy, all of your, your eyes turn up, your smile goes up when you're sad, both go down. And so like, uh, so knowing all this information through AI, uh, I suspect you would be able to make a very realistic model of the muscles in the face and be able just to reproduce these and reproduce them in a way that would seem so natural because uh, it would be evolving using the same techniques that the humans were used to evolve, except for they're cheating. They're just looking at the the output, right? So that's like, like GPT-3, all this stuff seems amazing, but it, you couldn't have done that without millions of years of evolution of language to be able to get to the point where we can actually do that. And we're kind of just kind of shaving off that last bit and training a computer to do that. But I, I think that part will be, I think we're going to have that probably in the near future where you have these, these kind of expressive robots that can, that can sort of. Very interesting, actually, you know, I got um, access to open AI's um, GPT um, API. Um, oh, a couple good, of days ago, I've been playing that. It's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. It took like six months or a year or something. You know, the guys are very slow. Yeah, I'm on the waiting list still. So, yeah. <laughs> well, hang tight. Um, one okay. of the things that I was um, interested about the fact that, you know, that there are um, implications for human behavior uh, when it comes to neuroscience also. For example, we know from personality psychology, what happens to the my area of expertise um, in which we've worked on uh, personality um, qualitative models like Big Five um, and Kettle's uh, 16 personality factors. And we know that physiological responses actually confirm uh, your personality traits also. So one, two things that you can confirm is the extroversion and introversion and your propensity um, to be sensitive to negative emotion, which is called neuroticism. And uh, we have tools like skin conductance um, and sweat level and oxidation level um, oximeters that you can use. And one of the fascinating applications for that is, um, I don't know if you know about the guy called uh, the Gottman Institute up there in Seattle. And they can predict through computer vision um, the, the chances of a couple having divorce uh, you know, in 90s, like 90% 90 or above, they can accurately predict that. And I was just wondering, how did they even get that? So did you use some kind of computer vision that record interactions of a couple and they fly them over to Seattle and you know, get them to talk about things that are uncomfortable? Yeah, uh, this is the, this is a written in blink. Is this the one where they have, they can just take uh, like a 10 second segment, exactly. with even not even listening to the voices, they could just more, 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 but just hear the deflection of the voices to find out what's going on. Yeah. yeah I one more thing, I mean, we'll just add yeah. one more thing before you can actually um, add for us. There's a company called Effectiva. You probably know that. And, you know, I know Effectiva. Um, yeah. So, you know, do you think that that can be useful in predicting that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I think, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about that a lot this year about, I mean, people automatically think it's kind of creepy that AI will be able to detect your emotions. And, and um, I guess the fear would be that they could manipulate your emotions, right? Um, uh, what was that? Uh, you can do that, machina. actually. There's yeah, a ex machina. Yeah, yeah. So they're doing, I mean, like, I guess Facebook is already doing that, right? They're already manipulating your emotions. So there's actually people from so. Cornell and um, Facebook um, together in which um, from your Facebook likes, if you have around 100 of them, um, the algorithm can predict you better than a coworker. If you've got 300 of them, better than um, your spouse. If you've got 500, better than yourselves. And they're yeah, very good at understanding it's... your behavior. No, but it, that's, it, it, to me, that's kind of fascinating that this, this whole idea of, of, yeah. Uh, so we give ourselves away. We're giving away our data and then we're sort of allowing a machine to sort of figure out what we're doing. And, and so let's think about the uh, what does that mean for us? So, so I think 
if we had AI that could detect our emotional state at, at, at a given moment, I think, I actually think it would be better. I, I do think that we would, as, as become more and more dependent upon these technologies, the fact that I'm in a bad mood, I would love it if it just didn't say, can you repeat that again? And I just keep repeating the same thing over and like, there might be better ways to engage and maybe AI could teach us how to, um, for example, uh, de-escalate a situation. Let's say you're angry and the AI is, knows you're angry. It could maybe ask you some questions to kind of co calm you down again, you know, and then you start to learn that and maybe do it with someone else is angry at you. You know, there's, there's ways that we could do this. I, I don't see, I don't see a future where we don't have at least some recognition of, of, of emotion in AI, because I think it become, it becomes too, as AI gets more and more advanced, it's, it's going to be, it's going to seem more natural to us as a species that these things start to understand our emotions better because otherwise we're going to be screaming at these devices for the rest of our lives. I suspect. Yeah. There is that aspect though. There is, a, I mean, the manipulation has been shown. You're right. Facebook has shown that, um, and uh, the past election here looks like that may have been um, sort of tweaked through algorithms to figure out what these people believe and then how to feed them information. So there is, uh, there is a negative aspect to it, right? But I think there's a negative aspect to people. There are certain people out there that will uh, take advantage of you because of the way you're expressing to yourself. So I could be doing a Let's say you and I are negotiating a contract and you could tell that I maybe that I had a fight with my wife the night before and I wasn't in a good and like somehow uh, during that thing, you said something and I agreed to something and I shouldn't have agreed to it. And uh, you took advantage of me. Right. And so there. So what's the solution for that? I could I could put on a burqa and I can only show you my eyes and you could never see any of my expressions. And then. And then I would sign the contract and leave. And then I just wear this around all the time so that no one can take advantage of me. Right. So we don't do that in societies. We don't tend to hide. I, mean, I think this stuff is given away for free. Our expressions were designed by evolution to be expressed to others, to perceive what we're doing. Right. And so I think given that the reason why the expressions are there to begin with are to inform others that it makes sense that we're going to inform these, these digital bots that we're going to be working with, right? But we also devolved the way to prevent that to occur. So if you went around like, you know, taking advantage of people uh, based on their emotional state, you get labeled a psychopath and people stop dealing with you, right? We have, we, have, we have ways in society that we have dealt with that. I'm not saying you're a psychopath, but I'm just saying we've evolved the way to protect ourselves against someone that does this, right? And so if an AI really starts like, doing that, yeah. And I really like the fact that you're very optimistic about um, the situation. And I had this LinkedIn post and then we had this ensuing long conversation in my Slack community about um, how these technologies uh, can not only harm, but also benefit people understanding themselves um, to getting in touch with their triggers, their behaviors. And these are the exact yeah. triggers that you know, those fan companies use to sell you um, things, you know, create relationships, suggest friends. So why not use it to your own, own benefits? For example, I know for this one thing that um, there are three clusters of personality disorders, A, B, and C, and the, some of them are um, introverted um, pro problems, other are extroverted problems. So one of the problems is borderline personality disorder, which is um, an instability in emotional state. Now, borderline personality disorder is um, a personality disorder in which you have um, a severe instability of emotions. So you can be happy like on a scale from one to 10 to 10, and you can be depressed at 10. Uh, so there's a lot of suicide um, and possibility, and there's also um, manic behavior and things like this. So if you understand your behavior and you have some kind of uh, variable um, you know, Apple Watch or something um, that gives you information on how you're feeling, um, or let's say your sleep cycles um, or your uh, heartbeat and things like this. I mean, that can be a source um, for authorities to get in touch with. Okay. Uh, but the question is about wearable devices that can help detect mental disorders, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, uh, so the idea around that is to me pretty fascinating. And, and um Actually, the former head of the NIMH, um, the National Institute of Mental Health, left the NIH to go to Silicon Valley to start a company dedicated to, to sort of finding this. And actually, what, what he's trying to do, he gave a talk 
at the last conference I went to, which is right before the pandemic, uh, at the Society for Neuroscience Conference in Europe. Um, and I was so excited because I really wanted to hear what the progress was at what he's doing. And so he was very cagey about it. But from my understanding, what they're looking at is that they're not looking at a wearable technology. They're not looking at anything else. What they're looking at is how do we interact with our devices? And it turns out, and I haven't seen the papers on this because they haven't published it yet, but what he was stating was that certain people with certain disorders interact with their devices, regardless if it's an Android phone or iOS device or something like that, in similar ways. And they would be able to detect things and get mental health information out by doing anonymous you know, stuff from the phones. And I, it looks like what he's trying to do is kind of build a company that will be you know, embedded into the firmwares of all these devices to help with the, uh, you know, the, the digital health type of stuff to be able to help you understand that you might be going through a manic depressive mood swing just by given the fact that you're typing much faster at some points and then versus, I don't know. I have no idea what, the, what, I mean, it can't be much more than that, right? It can't be maybe with the sensors on there, they can, they can detect other stuff. Like, uh, I mean, they can detect pickups. Do you, and, I, mean, I, I can't, do you think that, you know, um, neuroscience is probably more validated than behavioral science? Because in my personal experience, and I do that um, a lot, you know, I'm on advisory board of a lot of um, startups um, who do with similar technologies, you know, uh, making decisions based on your interaction with the computer and keyboards. Um, and in, um, in my experience, from all these three options where you can have survey data, um, you can have behavioral data, and you can have neuroscientific data, uh, what has predicted the most accuracy is the behavioral data. And that is why, you know, these fan yeah. companies uh, do that. And yeah. It's unbelievable um, how similar people are, despite their self um, created idea that they're very unique. And yeah. intelligent. Well, we have this and, idea of this individualism and stuff like that, but it, we also don't think we do the same things in the same ways, but there's like all those studies from the nineties of like, they can detect when you're going to turn on a light switch at a house with really accuracy. Cause like you tend to do the same things every day, even though we think we have free will and we're doing things ourselves. Right. Yeah. But behavioral data, I mean, I think, but I also think that neuroscience is the last on that list. Right. I mean, I think uh, I mean, that's what drives me crazy about those people that are like, you know, I, I do, you know, we do brain-based reasoning here. We, th um, we think about neuroscience when we do our decisions, but I'm like, as opposed to like, you know, liver based or lung based reasoning like, like what, are you, what are you talking about so that it turns out that if uh you know it's such an a, 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 it seems much more important than it is right i mean that you know the picture of a brain on a product uh increases the probability of something buying oh this looks like it's it could be helpful for for me somehow because there's a brain on there right but i feel like most stuff could be done um through surveys just ask somebody like how do how like how did you feel when i shook your hand oh i felt good okay or i could put you in an fmri machine i could shake your hand and i could look at the pleasure center and, oh look and so like for some reason that seems more real than them telling you that it's real but the absolute truth is the behavioral stuff because you're not even asking them they're they're you're doing it without, without you doing it and that stuff doesn't lie right and so i think that's the no, you're absolutely right about that. And I think it's, it's fine. I never thought about that from that way. I always thought about from, from, cause I feel like all those things, you know, when I say your name, I, I've been to so many of these talks where people are talking about neuroscience studies and just doing basic things. And like these basic things don't need to have neuro, you don't have to drag neuroscience into this. This is going to be just done with a survey. How did you feel when I said your name? Oh, you felt good. Okay. You know, we so don't many, need to so many yeah. people are doing that and you know you're trying to kind of salvage your name out of that well i'm not a neuroscientist if those are yeah no but but you're trying to it's like this it's, it's a whole cottage industry of neuro bunk right that they realize that that neuroscience is could be coming hot because we're starting to understand a bit more about this and they're trying to hop on it and it's it, and it frustrates me because it's it's the um uh my job is to be kind of the translator to what neuroscience research actually means. And I feel like this, I have to fight against this, this noise uh, of, of, of what it actually doesn't mean, right? So, or what we don't know yet, yeah. Um, I believe you have to run quickly so that I could just, um, or you have some time so that I could ask a question. Yeah, I've got about. I'm, I'm actually meeting my old my old PI for lunch today. So uh, I've got about another 10 minutes and we can, we can do some, some, some stuff. Sure. So I've got um, like two more questions, I guess. Um, sure. One is that you've been um, working um, 
tirelessly um, with children in schools, um, educating them about neuroscience and how it's not as hard as it sounds to be. Um, backyard brains give them access to tools that they can actually now use um, in their own small garages instead of going to laboratories. Um, most of this equipment costs forty thousand dollars up to eighty thousand um, dollars, which is not, of course, accessible. And one of the things that you have been doing is um, working with schools in Latin America. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that. Yeah, sure. So the um, we st we got a when we were first starting out uh, with with the with the company, we didn't have any uh, funding. We were still kind of doing stuff ourselves, like just kind of selling kits. And we got an opportunity to go down to to Latin America, down to uh, South America, into Chile for uh, an incubator there called Startup Chile. And they gave us some money to move down there. And when we moved down there, we realized, that, hey, man, this is a pretty good spot to be doing an education company, because unlike in the U.S. where, you know, even within cities, you have different schools that run things differently from each other. Right. And uh, let alone within a state, every every region of the state has something different, let alone the country, every it's different science standards, in different regions of the country. But in South America. There was only one science standard and only one way to teach it. And there's only one way. So it's like it was actually perfect for trying to get a new science in there that could get replicated in a bunch of areas. So we ended up staying down there. We moved down there. Uh, my my co-founder just moved uh, just recently, I think this year, uh, to, to another country. But we've been um, doing a lot of work down there. A lot of uh, I, I think the 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 work in Chile has been uh, pretty creative. There's that we have a different mentality of people down there that they, they uh we were making we were coming out of a maker space so we had a lot of creative folks around us that would help us come up with different ideas for experiments the robo roach was done down in south america all this stuff stuff was happening in in there um yeah so that was uh the big thing but can i just tell you really quickly what we're going towards in the future so i think the um kind of a breakthrough technology with with tiny ML. So, so I've been teaching computational neuro at a computational neuroscience course for over a decade. And I've yet to find something cool to bring into the schools that teach computational neuroscience. And it's been because it, it, everything you have to do, you have to code on a computer and you look to see if the output mat is kind of, it's not really exciting for kids. Right. And so uh, we have a new project that we were, we're excited about, which is this neural robot. So it's a, it's called the spiker bot. And it runs a spiking neural network. You can actually pop your electrode on a, on the computer and actually listen to the neurons uh, firing, right? So when it something comes by the camera, we have a neuron there that that tries to rep to figure out what the shape of that object is. And if it's a if you have like a neuron that responds to the color red, for example, then that neuron will fire. And then you can wire up the output of that neuron to another neuron, and then you have an inner neuron, and then you finally have a neuron that controls the motor, right? So then you, when the motor then the neuron fires and the motor starts to turn. So now your job is to wire these neurons together to create behaviors, which is exactly what animals do, right? And so it turns out with four neurons, uh, you know, left, right eye and left, right motor, um, motor neurons, that you can cross them over and you can get the robot to follow you around the room with these spiking patterns just because it sees on one side, if you're on one side, one neuron will fire more than the other and then it will rotate the wheel so that they're both firing at the same, then it will, when they're both firing at the same, it comes towards you. So it's just it's a beautiful showing of how neurons put together in certain ways. This is only four neurons. And, and if you add a couple more neurons, you can get it to come to you only when you whistle, for example. So you, now it's like a dog, right? And then and the, the robot will come to you. And so, but then you can go and pierce around and you can poke your electrode and understand why does that thing come to me? Because when I whistled, this neuron fired, only when this neuron fired, does it unblock this neuron, which allows that. And so like you start to see how neurons can become building pieces for a larger puzzle. And you can imagine we have 85 billion of these things. Like how complex can these behaviors get as you start adding more and more steps to it, right? So that's, that's to me is the exciting spot. And so we're um, we're about ready to to launch this. We just uh, we're we're get uh, NIH funding to to develop it again. So we're sort of we're doing some serious research into into the uh, work into the classrooms, making sure it's stable and stuff like that. But I think once we get this out, students and and the next generation are going to think completely different about robots. They're going to think about how can we build in these behaviors that they can learn themselves, right? So could we use these kind of reinforcement learning networks is sort of, uh, which is dopamine in the in the brain. So we have, 
digital dopamine that that basically acts like the reinforcement le- the networks and where you can train these robots with clickers to do different tasks and stuff like that. So I think the idea is we want these ro- these brains to be able to be shareable and that students can start to develop some interesting behaviors and then other students around the world can then pick up that behavior and start to enhance it and do it in some other ways. And so they're going to uh, start off by by creating a generation of students that actually understand computational neuroscience and be able to do that type of stuff. And then uh, this summer, we're also running. A, so Tiny ML was the other big breakthrough. Uh, if you're familiar with that, this is like these are like those big um, uh, deep neural network models, but they can run on really, really small pieces of hardware. Right. And they can use a coin cell battery and last for three or four months. And so. That's perfect for our stuff because we're going to be recording from EEG, which is a very slow signal. So it doesn't go that fast. And we'll be able to do things like um, free will detection. We're going to put some electrodes on the brain. And then when you move your arm, uh, you're, these are papers from the, from the 80s, actually, um, uh, Labette's papers that show that when you, vault, when you decide you're going to move something and you're, let's say you move your arm, your brain decides well before you made the decision that you're about to move. It, they call this the readiness potential, right? So this thing starts to creep up. And so there's this, uh, these cool experiments you can do that so like, I'm saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you sit there. Let's say there's a light bulb on the table. It's like, you can move your arm wherever you want, but just don't turn it when this light bulb is on. Just don't move it when your light bulb is on. So then the light bulb is randomly turning on and off, you know, and then every once in a while, the light bulb is on just as you're about to turn and you get that one's a bad trial. Right. And so that's a very simple thing. You're just going to move your arm randomly whenever you feel like it. But then what we do is record your EEG and we start to detect when the EMG comes and we look at the EEG to figure out what were the deflections before that point. And then on the second experiment, we're going to take the predicted output of that and feed it to the light bulb. The light bulb will come out when we detect that your arm is about ready to move. And there was a PNAS paper that came out in 2016 that showed using an older AI that they got to do it 33% of the time. So every, so it went from like almost none. It was like one out of a, maybe 1% to 33% of the time that every time you turn oh, that light came out at the same time as you did. So there's like, and so then the, the original papers were looking at, they had this clock there and they're trying to figure out you know, when did you make the decision to move your arm, right? And so it turns out that you make the decision about 150 milliseconds before your thing moves, but you can pick up on the EEG about 500 milliseconds. You know, that's a huge period of time that the brain knew that you were about to move. And then it kind of told, you became aware of that decision and then you moved, right? But it turns out that we tend to think in the opposite order that I thought to move and then I created the wave to do that. But it, we tell, we're telling ourselves a different story than what the data shows, right? So it's kind of a cool thing. And so it turns out that by doing this experiment, when the light bulb comes on, you can see the people stopping. Like, and so you can ask them, you know, they, they, so it turns out we have free won't. So even though We were planning on moving. We saw the light bulb come out, but we could stop ourselves in enough time. So we still have free will, but it's more free won't than free will, right? So there's a uh, a, free won't (laughs) instead of yeah, we have free won't. Yeah, so we're gonna try and do that this summer. We're doing a bunch of little AI things. We have a we have a pair of glasses that we're gonna put some electrodes on and then just detect not when your eyes saccading or when your eyes are closed. We're gonna just detect eye blinks. And have a little camera take a picture. Uh, they're called FOMO glasses, and we're going to have the ability that, at the end of the day, you can watch a small video of everything you missed when your eyes were closed, when you were blinking. Right. So <laughs> this, uh, these kind of little creative projects that are trying to do something simple using AI to uh, that, that attach to the biological signals of the brain to do some produce some pretty cool behaviors. So that's kind of I'm excited about that. Uh, that's kind of re- the next. Um, yeah. One of the reasons that I actually started the podcast initially was that my students, um, when I was teaching them about something, a book or an idea or um, a concept, you know, they would ask me, uh, well, can you bring this teacher to talk to us? And that's what I did. Um, I contacted the professor um, and, you know, they got to talk to my teachers and that got so big that, you know, I kept inviting wonderful people like you. And one of the things that um, I want to do is that to bring your um, equipment and science to my students in Pakistan also. So th- is that something that you would be um, oh, yeah. helping us with yeah, also? Yeah. Because why Latin America only? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, we, we do that. So we, uh, right now my, uh, so Tim is now living in South Korea and he's starting it up over there. And so we're, we are slowly expanding around. So we have, uh, we do have four versions of the company. We have Backyard Braids in the US, we have Backyard Braids in Chile, Backyard Braids South Korea, and Backyard Braids in Serbia. So we have, uh, so in all the continents, we're slowly moving our way over to Pakistan and, and we are working a little bit with China. So we're kind of getting onto the continent and moving over, over that way. So I suspect uh, we'll be near you soon. We do have just, we're, we're working with distributors, stuff like that. Yeah, the international market, I'm not a, it's funny because I, I'm the CEO of a company, but I'm not a really good business guy. I'm, I, as you can tell, I haven't talked about market strategy or anything at all, unless maybe to disparage it, right? But the, um, uh, so I think I, I could learn a lot more about how to how to grow the company a bit better than we are, but I like the way we're doing it. We're doing, we're kind of using that bootstrap method and kind of growing slowly and bringing people along with us. And so we're hoping that this will be a breakout year for us. We have uh, a new book coming out from MIT Press next year called How the Brain Works. And it's going to be all 10 years of experiments kind of crushed into uh, a small book that you can fold open and do the experiments yourself. Um, and we're going to be sort of releasing a whole bunch of new products that we think are going to be pretty sexy on the kind of this digital AI uh, brain machine interface type stuff that we're going to be working on uh, over the next six months. And so, yeah, I'm excited about the future and we'll, and we'll see how it goes. And I'd love to get over there uh, at some point to, to work with you guys and, and really make it happen on, uh, with boots on the ground to be fun. Sure, absolutely. Would love to have you actually. And looking forward to read your book. You know, I'm really um, excited to see, you know, how it looks like on paper. You know, more most of it looks very <laughs> good on TED Talk, but you know, let's see how it looks on paper that you can actually teach in the class. Yeah. So one final question is that um, in um, you're also working with Lexus in a designing experience for them. Um, and in that video, you, know, you are also teaching the science um, to your children. And I'm just wondering, you're a father now, and you know, once you have experiments, you know, lab experiments in your house, I mean, do you encourage them to learn science, um, human behavior, and things like this? And how does it work out for you? Yeah, no, it's funny. It was like, uh, especially the, my my kids were born in like 2014, like right at the birth of this AI movement, and I and here I have a brand new baby that's learning the way. And I just look at that thing completely differently, probably than most dads look at their kids. Cause I'm like watching all the small micro things that they're learning about gravity, all this type of stuff has been fairly fascinating for me. And as they've gotten older, uh, they do, they, they start to understand a bit more about neurons and about how the world works and about, so I'm trying to teach them not just about neuroscience, but just in broader sense, the stuff that I was kind of missing, like this, this, the big, the big picture type of science, like the, like the fact that we're on this, you know, this hundred thousand year mission as hum, Homo sapiens, and and where how much we've gotten in the last five hundred years, and that you are part of this life right now. I mean, to me, it's this. Once I once I had that realization of of where we came from and how, where we're going, it's so exciting, and it's so exciting to be alive right now. It may not be exciting in the next. 30, 50 years, but it's really exciting right now. Right. So I think uh, I'm trying to uh, not so much teach them the neuroscience, but give them the broader exposure to, to kind of the concepts that came before us and where we're going. Cause I, I find this, this particular road that we're on with it, with AI to be absolutely fascinating. It's, it's, it's scary and also exhilarating at the same time, but it, I want to be as close to it as possible because I think this is, this is the next phase of humanity. And it's, it's a pretty, pretty important time to be alive right now. And I think when the people look back at this transition point uh, to, to true AI, it's going to seem like a blip on the radar, but we're living through it. We're seeing, we're seeing the incremental progress happening. And some of it is not incremental. Some of it is exponential. I think GPT-3 is a good example of that. I wasn't expecting that for another decade. Right. But it's, here it is. Uh, and so Anyway, so I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a wonderful time to be alive, and I'm glad to have kids to help you know bring carry them through this this transition point and sort of see where, where things are going. It's absolutely fast. I, I, I'm surprised at like, this idea of consciousness, the fact that we can see each other, talk. To, like, we should be shaking each other. Like, can you believe this works? That we can do this? You know, this theory of mind, and we I can you know like all this beautiful evolution that occurred to allow us to get to this point that we just take it for granted. Right. So it's just, anyway, I'm trying to instill that, that sense of awe and wonder in the fact that what we have right now and what we're trying to produce in the future was there. So that's kind of what my focus is with my girls. So 
And, you know, what I admire about your work is that, you know, you are very um, charming when it comes to instilling joy uh, of learning uh, in people. And that's what I tell in my classes also, you know, if you're not enjoying it, if you're not um, you know, happy and you have this Tom Cruise is jumping the couch moment, you know, then it's kind of, uh, you know, not worth it. Um, one of the things that I noticed that, you know, you didn't actually move out uh, for the greener pastures of Silicon Valley. I mean, you just still stay in Michigan. It, 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 for some standards, it's kind of the poorest state in the U.S. And I was just wondering if that's, yeah, no, uh, that's you that, 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 that was <laughs> no, that was that was by design. So this is uh, I, I learned a lot about it. And I realized that I made a lot of mistakes about this. But I always felt that the two coasts, the you know, the people out of Brooklyn, people out of the Silicon Valley, they they talk differently than than me. They they would use they would use PowerPoints as weapons, like they would like and kind of show you what they're about to do if they just had that money, right? And I came from the Midwest, the Rust Belt, where you actually turned wrenches and built things and created things, and then you would talk about it, right? And so I never got that attitude of being um, this, and so I, I felt more comfortable here in the Midwest where you could try to produce things and then let people discover you and find out the old fashioned way. Right. I thought that was the way our things are done, but then I kind of realized that was probably not the best move because I think uh, ideas are important. Right. And I think whatever you can do to get your idea out into other people's minds, you should probably do it. And maybe that means, you know, making a PowerPoint slide and saying it's the best thing in the world before it occurs that you can get the money to produce that idea. Um, it just wasn't my philosophy at that time, but uh, maybe that was the right approach. But I, I kind of like being in the Midwest. I liked most of our stuff were our mechanical based things that we're building, you know, devices, hardware. And at that time we were starting it, the automotive industry had, was going through a huge recession, a lot of unemployment. So we had hired a whole bunch of people to build molds for us. And I, I kind of like that, like that kind of blue collar mentality of producing high tech neuroscience stuff using kind of uh, uh, underemployed auto workers to do that. So yeah, the, my, I grew up in, in Michigan and I'm staying in Michigan. I, I, I have experienced lots of other places. I've lived in South America, I lived in Europe for almost, you know, six years. I, I do realize that there are beautiful places around the world, uh, but I, I kind of like where I'm comfortable, right? I'm comfortable in the Midwest. We don't, we don't brag a lot. We, we're kind of more, I think you couldn't find a scientist that, I mean, you can, but they're, but they're rare, they're rarer to find out in the areas where you have to be always on, right? You have to always be happy or always be smart or always, I mean, you can't take yourself uh, uh, not too seriously. I think that was the the skill that that we kind of brought to it was kind of the humility of, of, of science and the fact that you can, you know, be silly, but also be serious about the point that you're trying to make. You don't, you, you can try to mix them up. And I think that approach would not have maybe worked um, in most areas and it seemed to work here. So that's why. That's why I'm here. Yeah, I totally understand. <laughs> you know, the town is actually yeah. known for and some great work in the automotive industry. You know, people yeah. are more uh, bucolic, honest, you know, hardworking, um, not bragging, not overselling. Um, and, you know, I don't know how far you are from Flint, which is officially the most poor. Yep, uh, no, just, just down the road um, from county. us. Yes. So, yeah, oh, no, really? it's not that far away. So we actually work with uh, some schools up there. So the we work with schools in inner Detroit. So those those are the things that get me going. Like those those types of engagements where I will still remember this. We Ypsilanti is even closer. It's like it's I can get there in like ten minutes in my car. It's a very poor part of our state. And going there with the Robo Roach just about a decade ago, and to a kind of like a kind of a underfunded classroom with kind of kids that have behavioral issues. One kid was in the back of the room, just like not get caring at all. I just try to be too cool for school, just sitting there like, mm, like just give me like stink guy the entire time. And when I pulled out that cyborg cockroach, you put the backpack on it, connected to it. And, st and like that kid was right up there on the edge of his seat, just watching that stuff. Like, like aha, I got you. you <laughs> so that's the stuff that gets, gets us going is that type of stuff. It's not the, you know, trying to get, 
Obama's children at Sidwell and Friends, the latest, greatest, which they were our early adopters, but we're now we're, fi- we're finally getting into the grassroots stuff, which which excites me. So yeah, man, that that's what's so inspirational about <laughs> you, and you know, that that's you know inspires me a lot. You're talking to people like you. Um, you're a great contribution to not only your community, um, your country, and and the world. Um, um, it's so sad that you know we have to um, call it a day at this point. Um, we got to run, but you know you have to promise me to come back on the show anytime you want. We I'd love con- to. Man. Oh, I, I enjoy it. There's so much more we could chat about. So, all right. I'd love to. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. For being- all right. Thank you.